absolutely the, the greatest honour to be here at uh, TEDx. It's over here gently. Um, and the thing I like about it is that they're so wide ranging, they cover so many aspects of the human spectrum. And there's one aspect of the human spectrum that's always I've been interested in, which is our irrationality, which covers everything. So I thought I'd just simplify it down and go to something fairly basic like weight loss and irrationality. Now, just consider the percentage of diets that fail, 95%. And yet, what we have is an industry that does fabulously well when 95% of the time it fails. How can this be pure irrationality is part of the answer? Now consider the political spectrum. Once again, on one end you have the right-wingers, some of whom, as an attribute of faith, they refuse to accept the science of global warming, and on the other end of the spectrum, they refuse to accept the science of vaccination. So this whole irrationality thing is a huge area, covers many different topics that I already just touched upon, and I'm not an expert in any of them. And so to cover myself from any legal action that might arise as a result of me <laughs> saying something wrong, I'd like to cover myself using the same political powers that in Australia the Commissioner of Taxation has under section 16555 of the Commissioner of Taxation to make it clear that any particular event that actually happened did not happen. So if I have to say that two and two is five, and you pick me up on it, I can say, well, under 16555, I wasn't even here. <laughs> the government being very broad has got it going the other way where they can declare that any particular event that actually did not happen, well, it did happen. And what I'm seeing here is a bit of quantum mechanics being married to financial affairs. <laughs> so it's going to be both in the government's pocket and in the Cayman Islands and maybe a little tiny bit of it left for you in the end. So let's just head away from the irrational side into rationality via a pamphlet which has this cover. And by the very careful disarray of the human female form, you can tell that this cover of the pamphlet goes back a long way, about two and a half centuries. And at the bottom you can read the words, an essay on criticism. Who by? Alexander Pope. And what did the Pope to say? He said, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Think, Hang on, suppose I know nothing. Well, I'm in trouble. If I know a little bit more, surely that's better than knowing nothing. And he said, no. A little learning is a dangerous thing. And then he went on to the second line, drink deep. Drink deep, or don't have any drink at all, of the Perian Spring. Perian Spring, okay, here's a map of Europe. And down at the bottom, you can see the sort of reddish sort of the area there. And over here, you head towards the area. So in Greece, Macedonia, <coughs> and if you go over there and have a big drink, you'll pick up some knowledge and maybe even wisdom if you really like. Maybe have some gene drugs you'll end up with enlightenment. So, and then he goes to say, on. there, if you drink from the Imperial Street, there, if you have a shallow drink, you just pick up a tiny little amount of knowledge, you'll think that you know everything and you're intoxicated with your knowledge. But if you drink deeply and solidly, then you'll realise that you have a solid knowledge and it won't be based on flip flame. So, this helps me deal with the blind spots that exist in the world. I have many blind spots, because I'm not an expert in anything, I'm a journalist. I don't have a DSC. If you have a DSC, you are an expert. So if, for example, the metallurgists say, hey, if you want to turn iron ore into steel, you have to add a percent or two of carbon, I will accept that science if that's the overall opinion of the vast majority of metallurgists. And if a geologist says, well, look, see that rock over there, that's igneous, and this one over here, that's metamorphic or alluvial, Whatever it is, I will accept the science if it comes from the vast majority of all the geologists <coughs> in the world put together. And if you have a three-year-old child and the child comes down with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and then the paediatric oncologist says what you've got to use is steroids and lymphoblastic <coughs> asparaginase, I'm not going to say, well, that's what you might say with your 30 years experience, but I read on the internet that I should use cyclophosphamide. No way. I'm just going to go along with every single <coughs> field of knowledge, whatever the overwhelming opinion of the scientists, engineers, etc. is, I will go along with their opinion. And nevertheless, we find in all societies we have these blind spots where we do not accept the opinions of the experts. In fact, it's part of the recent Brexit. One of the lines was, well, we've had enough of the experts. Right, let's move right along. So I'm <laughs> using here <laughs> blind spots only because they're well documented 
Now, I don't have as widespread a net of documentation <coughs> from other Western countries. So in America, 4% of the population refuse to think except that there is a link between smoking cigarettes and getting a lung cancer. 6% of the Americans refuse to accept that there's a link between a mental disorder, incredibly wide name, and something physical, electrical, mechanical, hormonal, biochemical inside your brain. 8% of Americans, and I do not know why, I don't know what they do, but they refuse to <coughs> accept the existence of DNA. What the heck have they got against DNA? It's arms to me. 15% refuse to accept that childhood vaccines are overwhelmingly safe and that they work. And 25% of Americans, this figure goes over a 40 year span, so they've been brought together from different areas. 25% of Americans refuse to accept that the Earth orbits <laughs> the sun. 40% of Americans refuse to admit that global warming is real, that we caused it, it's going to be expensive to fix. 40% deny that the, earth is, the world is older than 10,000 years. 40% deny the existence of evolution, even though we have to come up with new antibiotics because the bacteria evolved. We have to come up with new insecticides because the insects evolved. They refuse to accept it. And 40% of Americans refuse to accept that in any form of radioactivity, that radio dating, radiocarbon, radio uranium, any form of radio dating is correct. So we've got this situation finally that in America, even though they are not 51% of the population, are not skilled in cosmology, astronomy, or astrophysics, they refuse to accept the Big Bang. How much knowledge do they have in that field? Zero. Do they refuse to accept what the science says? Over half do. So getting back to everything, let's just pick up with an easy example in the land of weight loss. I came across this amazing diet just recently, the HCG diet. We think, what on earth is human chorionic gonadotrophin? It's a hormone made by women when they're pregnant, reaches a peak around 13 to 16 weeks, increases the blood supply to my favorite organ, the uterus, so there's lots of blood <laughs> to feed the baby as it grows and gets bigger. Clinically, it can be given to women to induce ovulation. And it does, of course, as side effects. And these include pulmonary emboli and blood clots, etc., etc. And in the HCG diet, yes, there is this diet. You can, and it does work in this sense, you can lose seven kilograms in three weeks if you inject yourself every day with HCG and put yourself on a starvation diet of 500 calories a day. <laughs> By the way, in the studies that have been done, if you just forget the HCG, you put yourself on a starvation diet of 500 calories a day, you still have the same amount. <laughs> and, and who are the people that are doing This is what really astonished me because I'm up the Sunshine Coast. And I came across these people who um, refused to accept the safety of vaccinations and fluoride and antibiotics because they were unnatural. And yet they would, on the internet, order this HCG, supposedly gathered from the urine of pregnant women in some foreign country, and then order it illegally, bring it into Australia, and then inject themselves into it once a day for three weeks because that was okay, but Antibiotics, they're unnatural. So you sort of thinking, wow, how irrational can we get? This irrational, even more unnatural. Let's go big, let's go bigger than an elephant, let's go to a mammoth. This is a genuine paleolithic carving of a mammoth. And so you can tell we're up heading. Yeah, yeah, the paleolithic diet. And so the story is that our paleolithic ancestors lived in wondrous harmony with the world around them, and they we supplied everything they needed to live a long and happy and harmonious life. And this all this this idyllic Garden of Eden existence came to a terrible end when our evil ancestors discovered or invented the evil agriculture. And in that period, since it's been around here, <laughs> there it's been saying 12,000 years. Well, obviously, that's too short a period for our bodies to have evolved to eat the evil foods that agriculture has given us, especially grapes. Oh, they're really evil. And by the way, what is Paleolithic? Well, it's sort of Stone Age or Hunter Gatherer. And that's sort of the overview. The history began around uh, 1970s, mid-1970s, with a gastroenterologist who uh, basically said, well, we humans are carnivores. Okay, you, you're wrong on that one. And that our Paleolithic ancestors ate a carnivore diet. Well, you're wrong on that one too. And therefore, we sh our ideal diet would be full of meat and fat and low in carbohydrates. Okay, there's your basic paleo diet. And 
if you do this, it is guaranteed that you will change from an aging, balding, grey-haired, pot bellied nerd, l l sitting in front of a computer, <laughs> to a tall, handsome young person with a tasteful fur bikini and a big eyes <laughs> and an upside-down pyramid body. That's what it'll do for you. The pain of your is guaranteed really quickly. But in the mid-1980s, it got picked up by some other people who then turned it into the evolutionary discordance hypothesis. Now, they, if you've got polysyllabic names, you must be right. And they said that the diet, the diet should consist of various things. Well, let's just run through them here. So, yeah, grass-fed meat, poultry, and seafood. Perfectly lovely. Uh, fruit, love fruit. Green veggies, sure. Nuts, eggs, roots, fungi. Nothing wrong with that at all. And then they said, no dairy, no grains, no legumes, no potatoes. I love olive oil. What's wrong with the Mediterranean diet? So they're right against that. And then they did say, and yeah, this is fairly reasonable, no salt and no processed foods. I don't mean foods that you process by you get the tomatoes and the garlic and the olives and the olive oil and you do your thing, but rather the stuff you buy, which is very high in salt. And all well and good, but what about the occasional birthday party? Oh, no big deal. And this has turned out to be the most outrageous money line. There are so many of these books for sale. If you want to, by the way, want to get fabulously wealthy, write a diet book. And by the way, here's a little hint extra. If you want to get really wealthy, incorporate a certain number of steps on the cover. A prime number is always best. Seven <laughs> is really good. So there's a few problems now with the paleo diet on every level. And they are basically that there was no single paleo diet. We can't eat what they ate because it's all gone. Um, we humans have evolved, and it's completely out of kilter with what the dietitians tell us today. So let's look at point number one. No one single diet. And they try to tell us that our ancestors are appeared from two and a half million years ago to about you know, five, ten thousand years ago. They ate the same diet everywhere in the world, from the cold bits of uh, South America to be high altitude to North America, into Africa, into Australia, into the Pacific Islands. They all, and the Indians, they all ate exactly the same diet. No way! With regard to just something as basic as how much of your energy do you get from meat, it varies from 99% down to about 12%, depending on whether you're the Inuit or the Kum. I think it's clicking a lot for that one. And so way in the, back in 1970 when they started coming up with this, we had pretty close to zero idea of what our Paleolithic ancestors ate. But since then, we've had the five places we've discovered, the middens, etc., and even the two who found their teeth. And we found that their diet was very varied, that they ate insects and cereals, and we found that they ate grain. Here's the paper and the title. Dental calculus. Uh, reveals unique insights into food items, cooking and plant processing in prehistoric Central Sudan. Well, just for a memory aid, a bit of geography here, down at the bottom left over here, you can see Egypt and Libya, Eritrea, and there's Sudan. In the middle is this little red area. Move up to the middle of the left is this red area. Looking at it from the air, you can see it flying a couple hundred metres over. Yeah, here you can see the excavation site. Number C, bottom right, there's a human being, a skeleton. Beautifully preserved in the ground with a narrow point of north. And over here in the middle, you see D. D is teeth. They are looking at teeth like crazy. And they found all sorts of things. And yes, they ate grains. They had lots of grains 30,000 years ago. They ate grains, right? They completely guess what the modern interpretation of the paleo diet says. Second thing they say in the paleo diet is we could not have possibly evolved quickly in that tiny microscopic period of only 12,000 years. Rubbish. Some of us, with a carbohydrate diet, have evolved to make more amylase in our mouth and that's our pancreas so we can better digest carbohydrates. In Japan, with a recent shift to the seaweed, some have evolved bacteria in their gut which make enzymes so they can break down the seaweed better. Blue eyes have been around for six to 10,000 years, that's recent. In Africa, the resistance to malaria uh, arose about five to 10,000 years ago. There are, to do with low oxygen, there are three altitude, three areas in the world where that <coughs> happens, in Ethiopia, Tibet, and the Andes. And in each of those three areas, the people have developed their own specific adaptations. 
be able to deal with low oxygen. Evolution goes this way, that way, and that way. And 7,000 years ago in Hungary, a mutation arose which then spread to the fact that one third of the world can drink milk. And I don't just mean a bit of milk with your tea, but I like mean like a milkshake. And two thirds cannot. Evolution is happening rapidly, it's still happening. Problem number three, can we eat what our ancestors ate? Well, mostly no, it's not as lean as it was. Mind you, Skippy is pretty lean, but how many people eat kangaroo? Um, we don't have any of the big mammals of the auroch and the, the moa, but we've evolved the food along the way to suit us. And so you start off with a skinny grass in Central America, and it's maybe the diameter of a match head, and we've turned that into corn. Tomatoes began as tiny little berries, and this guy down here, everybody knows about the kale, chips, and everything else, they're all the same thing. Cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, the same thing, we've just evolved them slightly down different pathways. Problem number four, the nutritional aspects of the Paleolithic diet. Well, what they're saying is a high protein diet that is out of kilter with what the dietitians recommend. And they say moderate to high fat, and the dietitians say no, and then the way they deal with that is, you're wrong. But even though they've been to university for five years, you're wrong, I haven't been to university at all, I haven't studied dietetics at all, I'm right because I want to be right. Um, and the whole no grain thing, we were eating grain for the last 30,000 years. And one difficulty about it is that the honey cover existence could be tougher times, and so sometimes you'd be reduced to eating bark, and you'd be uh, roots of trees and stuff. And so they had a high fibre diet. How high? 100 grams a day. You try really hard a day, you'll be pushing to get 30. They had 100. Is that incorporated into the paleo diet? No way. So the dietitians, oh, by the way, anybody can call themselves a nutritionist and certain People on Celebrity TV have uh, done a course on the internet and after 15 minutes they've got a little certificate and they've printed it up and now they are an official nutritionist. In my case, as a medical doctor, I studied eight hours of dietetics in my medical studies and I knew what I didn't know and I knew immediately how far I was out of my death compared to people who spent four years. Eight hours versus four years, I've got a problem, I go to the experts. You've got a dog, don't bark. Right? So it's a different thing. And so the dietitians of the world all have voted every year and you know, they have a big diet, a big, big competition where they vote the worst diet. And basically the Paleolithic diet comes down near the bottom. And in 2014-15, it was equal bottom with the Ducan diet, which is kind of similar. So going back to Alexander Pope and his words, the little learning is a dangerous thing. We can then absorb that, but then take it to another level with the words of Sir Francis Bacon. If a man shall begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts and acknowledge that we don't know and then fix it, he shall end in certainties. Now, everything I've talked about has been totally 100% true. And if it hasn't been, well, it should have been, it shouldn't be, it doesn't matter because under the goods and services act, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.